Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, good afternoon. Um, as Bill strongly hinted, I'm an Englishman. It's been a painful year for me here in Wellington. You know, we had... Um, uh, it started off with the Cricket World Cup. Uh, I was at the Westpac Stadium when Brendan McCullum single-handedly demolished the England team. I think he got 76 runs off hardly any. Uh, everyone seemed to be a six, you know? So I was sitting with the English commissioner, rapidly rediscovering my Irish roots. Um, <laughs> It got worse with the Rugby World Cup. Um, on the day of the Australia game, I looked on the Daily Telegraph and it said, uh, please God, not the Australians. <laughs> and um, I then got a, a, I live out in the eastern suburbs in a place called Breaker Bay and I got a, an email from some friends who live about 100 meters away from me saying uh, we're starting rugby breakfasts uh, for the World Cup. Would you like to come along? And at the bottom there was a, uh, a photograph, coach for sale, low mileage, England rugby. <laughs> so I, I, I emailed back saying, um, grudgingly, I'll come along, but I'm going to walk. I'm not catching the coach. I don't want to double the mileage. Um, but it was a wonderful uh, final in the end. You couldn't help. Uh, I think actually both teams played the game as it should be in the right spirit. Uh, they didn't seem to be overburdened by the occasion, which often happens in these finals, and I thought it was a brilliant demonstration uh, of rugby. But it wasn't the biggest triumph this year. It was the C299s, which I'm a midfielder for, um, on the Theatre of Dreams in C2, which is in the eastern suburb, and we won our Masters League this year. And I got one, my one solitary goal this year. Um, and what was really shocking about that goal was it was intentional. I'm still, I'm still in shock. So um, what I, I guess there are three themes for me in terms of digital gov government and digital city, really. One is uh, it's not really about the technology. It's about transforming how your organization works. So it's all the other things. The technology is merely an enabler. Uh, it's also about disruptive technologies happening and, and being able to adapt to those disruptive technologies and reinvent uh, how you do things. And it's about big data. It's about getting the information, understanding the patterns, and, and doing things in a different way. And I'd like to go back to my roots in Northeast England, actually, to begin with uh, why that's so important. Um, so when I was chief executive of Newcastle, we had a lot of... Uh, the council owned 39,000 council houses, uh, which were basically social rented houses for people on low incomes. And uh, when I arrived in the city, we didn't really do housing repairs in a great way. So imagine Mrs. Smith on Arcasia Avenue, and she has a broken door. In the bad old days, she would ring up the housing department, and they'll say, well, how do you know the door's broken? She said, well, it, it doesn't work said, well, we'd have to send an, an inspector out to check that it's really broken. So the housing department would send an inspector out and speak to Mrs. Smith and say, well, actually, um, the door's broken. She said, well, I know that. What are you going to do about it? Uh, well, you need to ring City Works because uh, they, they actually fix the repairs. So Mrs. Smith rings City Works and they say, well, we don't trust the housing inspectors. They're useless. We've got our own. Uh, we're going to have to send another inspector out. So the city works inspector goes out, and he said, well, Mrs. Smith, the door's broken. Well, she said, I know that. Ring this number, and uh, we'll get someone to fix it. So ring city works again, an operative comes out, fixes the door, and then the post-completion uh, inspection process begins with both inspectors. So five visits to do one simple repair, and it really was like that. And this was a, the first phase of e-government. What we did was we actually redesigned the service around Mrs. Smith's, who needed the repairs doing. So instead of having two different departments handling this, we had one. Uh, we introduced contact center technology, um, appointment systems, and we did something really brave. We thought for simple repairs, we would trust the customer. Um, now, I think in the digital world, that revolution can go a stage further. Instead of having to ring someone, it's simply an app. You can take the photograph on your, on your mobile device and you're going to a, a completely new level. 
The point I'm making, it's not about the telephone technology and, and the apps really, it's about trying to empower the customer and design things around the customer and it's all of the changes uh, you do. And incidentally, when we uh, did the first stages of e-government, we saved four million dollars a year because we didn't need 78 inspectors in city works and the housing. And actually we, got, we repurposed those staff to do more repairs. So there was a win uh, on all sides, a win for the ratepayer, a win for Mrs. Smith, and a win for the inspectors, because it's far better to actually go out and do stuff as opposed to just uh, checking on things. Uh, so I think it's quite a powerful story, really. Um, and, you know, I guess that's my clear message today. Digital government and digital city is really around that transformation agenda rather than simply uh, the technology. And you can see um, some of the disruptions in, 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 in our daily lives now. I mean, Uber is an absolute classic example. It's changing the whole landscape of taxis and transport. Uh, we've seen the likes of Amazon uh, changing the way we shop. Uh, here in, in New Zealand, the likes of Trade Me changing how we uh, look for a job or how we buy and sell homes. And uh, another great example is Air New Zealand, one of the world's most successful airlines. Why? Because it's embraced uh, digital working. Uh, compare it with Qantas, with all due respect to our Australian friends, it, it's, it's, it really has embraced digital working and it's a really great uh, customer experience because of that. But I think we've got to also be humble in the public sector and local government. Some, in some ways, uh, we are somewhere behind uh, what's been happening in the world of the private sector. Um, even today, uh, with a resource consent uh, or a building consent process, uh, you, you work with your architect, it's all done digitally, and then you've got to print it out manual and take it manually uh, to the civic center and hand it over, and there's a big paper process uh, to deal with those processes. So there is a real risk of a digital divide emerging between what's happening in shopping uh, and uh, transport and airline travel, et cetera, et cetera, hotels, banking, insurance, and what's happen happening in the world of government. Um, that's why we're, we need to up our game. Now, Wellington City Council actually started off as a real pioneer in this space, we, I think we were the first city in the Southern Hemisphere to have um, broadband, and we were the first city in the Southern Hemisphere to have free Wi-Fi in the CBD. So there, we started off in a pioneer, as a pioneer, and others have caught up and overtaken us. So what we're doing now is playing catch up. We need to up our game, and there are a whole bunch of things we're starting to do, which I think are pretty exciting, and I'll give you a little flavor uh, of that. But it has to be around this whole transformation agenda. It's not just the kit. It's really around building things around the customer, having more self-service, empowering the customer, changing the way you provide services. So one thing we're doing, we have, a, we have to have the right technology platforms to be able to do all these clever things. So we have a program which we've called the Odyssey, and I, I imagine there's a few of you who will know the, the story of the Odyssey. It took 10 years for Odysseus to get back uh, to his uh, island from Troy. Uh, we're hoping to do it rather quicker than 10 years, but we have to have a sound platform so that our systems can talk to each other. We've got systems that can use cloud-based technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So that's in, in train at the moment. We also have something called the target operating model. That sounds real mouthful, doesn't it? But basically, it's, um, it's a plan for introducing digital government and how we change the organization over a five-year period. And what we're doing is we're looking at our regulatory services uh, to see how we can actually move them into the digital uh, space. So we started off with uh, building consents, but we'll be looking at environmental health and functions like that uh, going forward. Um, and the building consents program is worth talking about. Currently, on average, it takes 41 days uh, to um, uh, deliver a consent to a, 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 a homeowner. Um, and under the digital program, we're hoping where you don't require any changes to bring that from 41 days down to 10 days. Now that's transformation. That's a dramatic change uh, in the process. 
We've also done some interesting things in the whole area of asset management. In a way, it sounds, again, a boring area, but this is where we spend $5.5 billion over the next 10 years, and a lot of that spend is on pipes and roads um, and things like that, and buildings. And we've been doing a lot of work to have real-time information on the state of our assets. Now, the way a lot of our renewals have worked in the past is we've looked at different asset classes and we've used accountancy assumptions about when they need to be renewed. But when you have real information on the state of those assets, you've got better data to manage the services. In our long-term plan, we were able to release $90 million because we were renewing things too frequently. That's a huge amount of money which can be diverted into other more needy uh, areas. So that really has delivered a massive thing and it's about uh, digital management. We're part of a pilot uh, with a number of other New Zealand cities for uh, to have e-voting at our local body elections uh, in October uh, uh, the next year. So we're all looking forward to that. And as a city, we've embraced webcasting and uh, um, we're also a big user of social media. I remember years ago uh, seeing a presentation from the chairman of Ural Tunnel and uh, they had a, a crisis. There was snow in northern France, and the new trains they'd bought couldn't cope with the snow, bit of a design problem there, and they were all breaking down, and it became a huge problem. And initially, Eurotunnel did the traditional press thing, oh, everything's okay, we're doing X, we're doing Y, and all of these photographs started appearing on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and what have you, showing that actually they, weren't, they were telling porky pies. And, and I think these days as public organizations, we are 24 by seven, we have to embrace social media. It really has changed the way uh, communications has worked. Um, we've, we've done some interesting things in terms of how we consult and engage with the public. So every three years we have to update our 10 year plan for the city and normally, um, you know, not, not many people in Wellington get excited by a long-term plan. Surprise, surprise. Uh, probably, you know, 206,000 people in the city, probably normally about 1,000 would respond uh, with formal uh, emails or letters or whatever. And out of that 1,000, probably about 150 would actually come to oral hearings at the city uh, council. Um, and they're, they're not representative of, of the silent majority at all. So this year we had a, a, an interactive website and we had a 400% increase in the number of people engaging. Now, 4,000 as opposed to 206,000 living in the city isn't good, but it's a huge change and it shows you the power uh, of digital working. Um, we've got, uh, and actually we won some awards for that engagement process. Uh, our libraries, uh, Jane Hill, our, our, our city librarian, can tell you much uh, more about it than I can, but we are certainly embracing uh, the digital world there. We have, I think, almost 100 PCs across our libraries so that people can use, do free online courses and tutorials, have access uh, to the web, etc. We're also um, quite a sizable housing uh, owner. We own social housing across the city and we have community centers in those housing estates which also have similar facilities to our um, libraries. We're obviously making much greater use of e-books, though there are some severe restrictions in New Zealand which need to be lifted. Um, and one interesting project we're doing at the moment is with a company called, a Japanese corporation called NEC. We've got a pilot in the Cuba Street area of Wellington to have a range of information sources from sound, smell sensors, so sensors that can hear, sensors that can smell, and CCTV all combined, uh, linking, uh, creating a database and linking that database into uh, the health service, the police service, the city council, et cetera, et cetera. So this allows us, uh, for example, to spot um, antisocial behavior, and alerts the police quickly. It allows us to uh, smell somebody spraying graffiti uh, on a building 
and so on and so forth. Now that's all great, but what's really powerful is, is when we apply this to the whole CBD is building up the patterns and then changing the way policing and health works uh, to actually make better use of that information. So that's quite an exciting initiative. What of the future? Uh, there are some really interesting applications for some pretty basic services. So uh, earlier this year, I think it was around May time, we had some major flooding problems in, in the Wellington region. And one of the problems you have is some of the drains get blocked up and they don't work as well as they could do. So uh, we're actually looking at putting sensors in the drains to spot blockages uh, more quickly than a normal inspection process would identify those. Um, we're also looking at dustbins, sensors in the dustbins. It's been done elsewhere. So instead of having fixed routes where you end up uh, going and some of the bins are full, some are over full, and some are pretty empty, you actually redesign your service around bins that are just about full. So these are really quite disruptive changes around basic services, but they're also quite revolutionary. Another area we're looking at is uh, LED lighting. Uh, replacing our current stock of lights with LED lights, but we want solar panels and Wi-Fi on those lights as well. And instead of lighting then becoming a cost to the city government, it can actually be a revenue earner uh, for the city government. So again, it, it just changes uh, the way you do things. So in some ways, digital is about faster, better, cheaper, but I think it's much more fundamental than that. It's about changing the way you operate. And it's also about coming, dealing with disruptive changes outside of the city government. I mean, in the UK, for example, there are private websites that actually enable you to you know, identify potholes and things like that. And, and you go through that private website and it comes through, through to a city government where, wherever you are. So it's, it's, it's not always through the city government, it can be through channels outside of the city government. And I think we've, we've got to get used to that. Um, as uh, Douglas Engelbart said, the digital revolution is far more significant than the invention of writing or even of printing. Uh, but I, I think the key thing for me is, is attitude. Um, you know, are we going to see this as an opportunity or are we going to see it as a problem and be, be afraid of it? I'd like to illustrate it with a very simple story. Turn of the 20th century in Manchester, England, two shoe salesmen get sent to Africa to expand the uh, shoe, shoe empire. One, a pessimist, goes there, telegrams back, situation hopeless, nobody wears shoes here. The other, an optimist, telegrams back, glorious opportunity, nobody wears shoes here yet. We've got to have the right opportunities, See, seize them, see them as opportunities going forward and get on with it. So thanks for listening. <laughs>